there. Welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. It's our great privilege to have you with us to talk about the subject you probably know more than anybody else in the world, or at least as much as anybody else. Uh, for our members and for people who are uh, participating in this uh, interview, uh, I want to mention that Bear Anders Rudling is Associate Professor at Lund University, that is in Sweden, and uh, he specializes in the area of uh, Polish-Ukrainian Belarusian borderlands history, specifically uh, with the emphasis on the nationalism and um, uh, 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 politics uh, that it produces. Um, per uh, was, got his PhD in Edmonton, Canada, uh, the area where there's a lot of uh, Ukrainian uh, immigrants uh, or refugees or DPs, maybe all of them. And uh, he is, um, what I've read that he wrote, was to me quite revealing. And that is why I invited Per uh, Anders Rudling to talk to us and to clear up some of the things or some of the notions we may have about Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, per, welcome Many to thanks. Chicago Jewish Cafe. Nice it's to be nice, you know, sitting in Singapore, you With know, coffee. <laughs> and drinking coffee. This is your morning, you know, for me it's evening, so I do not drink coffee in the evening, but in the morning I'm going to drink. In any case, uh, Per, how uh, come uh, a guy from Sweden uh, got interested in um, Belarus and then Ukraine and a little bit of Poland? Why? It's a long story, you know. Uh, I grew up in Sweden and uh, I grew up in a region that actually offered Russian in high school. It was the only um, high school that offered Russian um, in my province. And they hadn't offered it since the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and Russia became not so popular. Then came Gorbachev and Perestroika. And in 1989, they offered it. If it were nine students who can ask for Russian, they would be forced to give it. So we started as nine students, we ended up as four, but we did three years of Russian. Then I continued in Uppsala. I want to become a teacher myself uh, in Russian, German, and history. And uh, so, I, so I did. Uh, then I continued into history, and uh, I did my MA in San Diego, in California, uh, where they didn't have at my university uh, a very strong Eastern European Studies department, but a very strong department of East European Jewish history. And that was a topic I was interested in. Uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jewry and uh, Ukrainian Jewish-Polish relations. So I worked with that as a Slavist first and then as a Jewish studies history major. Then I continued uh, working on Belarus. And uh, I found this very interesting. This was a time when Lukashenko came to power. Um, and in a region where nationalism is hegemonic, here you have, you know, the Kaczynskis in Poland a little bit later on, right? You have, you know, you have uh, essentially emigre leaderships in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania that are very sort of pro-Western, very fiercely nationalistic. And you have in Western Ukraine a similar sort of development. And then you have Belarus, where in the first and only free election, they vote for a candidate who promises to restore the Soviet Union or a union state with Russia in one form or another. And to me, this was a very sort of interesting concept and trying to make sense of this. Why is Belarus so different? And I realized there was virtually no books in English or German written on Belarus at that point. It's a state larger than Sweden, larger than three Baltic republics combined, and yet very little interest. So I got interested in that, sort of like the idea of border issues. Uh, I had no personal or private or family connections to this region. There was strictly academic interest. I have now, I have a wife who's Lithuanian, but that happened much later. Uh, but I have no sort of family background in this. This was strictly an academic interest. 
I did my PhD in Canada, and they indeed they have a large Ukrainian community, and uh, that got me interested in uh, a number of uh, uh, various uh, immigrant nationalist groups that were active uh, in, in, in that country. And um, the more I worked on the Holocaust, and I felt that, well, here you have an, uh, two solitudes. You have Jewish history, you have Ukrainian history, and you have two historiographies, which are incompatible to some extent, particularly when it comes to the Holocaust and the 1930s or 40s. And I felt perhaps a little bit naive, like there are some obvious black, uh, blind spots, obvious holes in the story. Maybe I can bridge that as somebody who's an outsider working with Jewish history, working with Ukrainian and Russian history. Maybe I can, uh, as, as I know by now, this was maybe a little bit naive. There are indeed uh, there are possibilities of conversations and, and exchanges, but uh, the narratives remain as uh, polarized to some extent as ever, even though there are exceptions, of course. When did you come to the realization that it may be your idea of uh, this um, bringing about or facilitating the brotherhood between Jews and Ukrainian uh, might have been naive? What was the point? What was this part? Well, I was never, never saw my job as bringing about brotherhood or reconciliation. What I saw was simply that you have historiographical traditions that, you know, there are simply, I think, very few topics in modern European history where there are absolutely no agreement. I would imagine if you worked on Yugoslavia in 1991, 92, or if you work on Israel, Palestine, you might have a similar sort of like, you know, two parallel tracks that, that don't meet, right? Um, I... Uh, I don't think I saw my, didn't see my job as sort of reconciliation, but to fill these blanks. Uh, I realized that rather soon when I actually won my first academic articles, uh, when uh, I submitted, I did a critical review of the leading sort of chronicle of the Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA, it's a massive volume uh, enterprise known as the Litopis UPA, the chronicle of the UPA, which was funded partially by the CIA in the 1970s as part of Cold War covert action programs, and which is essentially whitewashing. But uh, it, was, uh, it was started in uh, 1943, right? UPA, yes. Uh, UPA was founded in 1943, essentially as the armed wing of the most radical Ukrainian uh, interwar uh, nationalist organization. Working with of Nazi Germany, right? Uh, not, yeah, yeah, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists uh, was set up in 1929 and it worked with a number of uh, revisionist states, first founded by Lithuania, then funded and trained by Mussolini's Italy, and then after 1939, primarily by, by Nazi Germany. Uh, until after Stalingrad, uh, they did a half-hearted break with the Nazis because they realized they would not, one, they would not get the Ukrainian state recognized, and two, the Nazis would lose the war. And then they sort of decoupled from the Nazis. And uh, even though they resumed collaboration again on, on a more modest scale, but nevertheless in cooperation after September 1944. So it had a period of cooperation, even though the, 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 the proponents of the nationalist narrative would say that UPA was the Ukrainian insurgent army was set up only in 1943, which is true. But its parent organization uh, was the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, and about 70 plus percent of the officers had had a background in various German collaborationist uh, uh, auxiliary formations, right? Well, if we'll have the time, I would like to ask you about the history um, going back before uh, Second World War, probably going back to the First World War, mm -hmm. 1919, 1920, and to yeah. Mitro Donsov, right? And yeah. Uh, yeah, what, but, 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 right now, but right now, I just want you to answer the question that I asked before. That is, at what point you have come to a realization that the issue may be more complicated than you expected? Oh, I think almost immediately. One of my first academic endeavors uh, was to write a critical you know, uh, engagement with his chronicle of Litopis Opa. And I submitted that to one of the leading Ukrainian studies journals. And uh, I got the letter back, you know, explaining why they couldn't even send it out for review and essentially harping upon what sort of person I was. Uh, so I said, like, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, uh, I guess what sort of person I am is, is I guess it's less of, less of interest here than, than my research. And I submitted it to East European Jewish Affairs instead, and it was published, and it remains one of my most cited articles, uh, what I did as a young grad student, right? Uh, I realized very soon that this was 
very difficult topics to work with uh, to find any form of common language, at least with the Ukrainian uh, diaspora uh, in Canada, the bulk of it uh, being people, as you pointed out, descendants of uh, the so-called displaced persons, the so-called third wave of Ukrainian immigrants that came to Canada, uh, where the, uh, the supporters of the UUN constituted roughly 70 to 80 percent of that wave that came after 1948. That group of people and their pedigree and descendants um, have not been, to put it mildly, very open to discuss these these issues. But there's also a so-called fourth wave of Ukrainian immigrants that came after the collapse of the Soviet Union from Central and Eastern Ukraine, which have, uh, uh, I should point that out, you know, very relaxed and uh, rather moderate attitude towards this, even though the popularity of the UN and UPA has been stimulated by the government for now for over a decade. So a, a generation grow up with this in Ukraine, in which uh, Bandera and UN and Shukhevich, the leader of the Ukrainian insurgent army, are treated as as heroes uh, and as fighters for Ukrainian statehood. And that is how they, re they are, they are rem uh, remembered officially. And they were fighting for Ukrainian statehood. And I don't really have an issue with that. The issue I have is, is, is what I was interested in specifically was Ukrainian-Polish, Ukrainian-Jewish relations. And in particular, this rather small, what de facto was a sect of extremists of a few tens of thousands of UUN and OPA members. They are not synonymous with Ukrainian people. I want to point it out. No more than the NKVD is associated with any particular ethnic group, right? You know, this is, I'm starting a political movement which was national and which committed atrocities. And that was my sort of point of departure. Uh, thank you for talking about it and for explaining this. But uh, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you, yeah, of course, the people who themselves were members of these uh, ex ultra nationalist fascist groupings, by comparison to the total number of Ukrainians, is not that much. But in my mind, they have expressed the sentiment of a big segment of Ukrainian population. And today we see that Ukrainian nationalism is a big power in Ukraine in a way that I do not know where it's going to take that country. It's the growing support. Uh, I mean, if when Yushchenko, I have, don't have the exact numbers in front of me here now, but when in 2010, when former President Yushchenko made Stepan Bandera, the leader on the most radical wing of the UN, a hero officially of Ukraine, the approval for that was... I believe, if I'm not mistaken, around 25%, right, uh, that support this in one way or another, very unevenly distributed. In Western Ukraine, clearly a majority, I guess 70%, if not more. In Eastern Ukraine, less than 10%. So it's a very divided society in that sense, right? Now, according to the most recent polls in the past year, a majority uh, is of Ukrainians, so, uh, the, the opinion polls indicate, support uh, the sort of, the, the, the have a positive attitude towards the Ukrainian insurgent army and Bandera and Shukhevich. And that is, of course, partially a result of the fact that Ukraine is at war. De facto, one part of Ukraine has been annexed by the Russian Federation. There's national mobilization taking place. A generation grew up with this. It's a society which labors under other extreme conditions. But yes, you're right that, that this is uh, catering to and uh, finds a resonance among growing numbers. Uh, of, of, of Ukrainians. But with a disclaimer, I want to say that Ukrainians don't know much about this, right? That's, that's the paradox. They know relatively little about this. They have a heroic account of this, right? They do not know this. They, if they, I, my take is that if there was better research, if they had published serious research on the legacy of Shukhevich, of the Ukrainian insurgent army, of the Holocaust, of the ethnic cleansing of the Polish minority in Berlin, already in the 1990s, had a candid discussion about this. I would think that the Ukrainian leadership under Yushchenko, certainly under Parashenko, would be more reluctant to embrace these particular figures, which are at odds frankly, with, with the ideas of democracy and Western European integration that they profess, right? So there's a paradox, right? Per, uh, I will allow myself to disagree with you on this point. In fact, my uh, uh, observation and my feeling is that when Ukrainians do learn about these things, 
the immediate reaction is um, astonishment, not knowing what to do. And the final reaction is just to forget it and not to touch the subject again. They do well, not I'm... want to look into it. They do not want to learn. They do not want to study. They do not want to do anything with it. And it, it has to do not only with Shuhevich and not Bandera and others. Uh, Ukraine has a history of, um, if I would, as a Jew from Soviet Union, who was born in Vinitsa. I was there two, two years ago. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I became very much interested in Ukrainian nationalism is because I gave my life for liberation of those people. I was exiled from the Soviet Union in 1974, first time after 13 years when Gorbachev came to power, I was allowed to go back to see my mother and then a week before my visa expired, they detained me again, and by the order of Supreme Soviet of the USSR, deported me second time. Um, I give all of my life to freedom of those people. That is, not only Ukrainians as Ukrainians, but to freedom of all Soviet people. And when I stood on the stairs of the White House in, on Tuesday, in August of 1991, and I thought I was going to be killed there because we expected paratroopers from Moscow River to storm the White House. It dawned on me that all of my dream of free Soviet Union was going to go nowhere because Soviet Union was collapsing with Yeltsin being head of Russia and all other republics were going to be succeeding from Russia, including Ukraine. And I was not born in Russia, so I did not belong to Russia. And in Ukraine, I was a Jew, therefore I was not Ukrainian. And then when I, two years ago, but that did not bother me because I, I thought, well, at least people are free and they can make decisions for themselves. You know, that's the beginning of all. But then two years ago, I went to Vinica and um, I met some people there at the leadership of uh, local lead leadership in Vinica. And uh, I've heard some things that just struck me really, really unpleasantly. Like, for example, Hitler is the real leader. That is, to my face. Now, it was said by an idiot who did not recognize that he was talking to a Jew. But it was for high-level, highly respected idiot within Vinica. And right next to him was sitting another guy who was a previous colonel in KGB. Uh, I do not want to mention their names because they're not important. Um, but when I came back to the United States, three weeks later, I get the news that in Vinica they put monument for Petlura. Mm -hmm. Now, I did not know much about Petlura, but I knew from my grandmother and from Jews that knew, and it was not only because they knew from the Soviet sources, but in their own experience, that Petlura was associated with massacres of Jews during the Civil War. Or his troops, his troops were uh, not he himself, but his troops were, and he took limited interest uh, in 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 these atrocities. He was, and I don't think himself was an anti-Semite, but his troops certainly revolved with the largest numbers of pogroms in, in Ukraine, and he himself uh, was not addressing this issue and let this happen essentially. Right? It is a crime of neglect and indifference to massive uh, atrocities. Yes, I, 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 I'm familiar with the discussion and I, I would imagine that somebody with a Jewish background from Vinica seeing a monument to Petlura would certainly, and I, would, I don't disagree with you here, you know, it's a problematic proposition to have such a monument in a state which comparts, presents itself as pro-Western democratic society. Uh, even though, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry to interrupt you. No. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but uh, that's what made me, because until then, until that Petlura monument, yeah. I never thought about the issue of Ukrainian nationalism. Because right. I thought 
that what I've worked for, I have accomplished. That is, I freed, I contributed to freedom of the Soviet people from the one party communist dictatorship. And I thought that I've done my job. But then with that Petlura there, that gave me another reason to live. Hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, and I, 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 I think we're in agreement uh, to a large extent that you seem to indicate here. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I've been working on, I'm working currently on the, on the work on Shukhevich, the leader of the UPA, and on Mikola Lebed, who was number three person in the UN. And uh, I think you're right about that. I mean, one section of society, once they, once they learn about this, there is one group which is very interested in that. Another group is not. And the further the Ukrainian state has gone along these roads, once you raise erect monuments to Bandera and Shukhevich, it's going to be very difficult to take them down. It's going to be difficult to reckon with these episodes of history. Once the state has got in bed with these the, the, the sort of like revisionist narratives, you know, it's easy to tear down Lenin monuments, but at some point, I think the Bandera monuments might have to come down also. And that's a difficult proposition, particularly now. And it's interesting, you mentioned Vinitsa. I'm, I'm working on Shukhevich right now and the so-called Nachtigall Battalion, which marched in with the Germans in 1941. Um, in the official narrative, they are essentially whitewashed, uh, that's presented essentially as, as national freedom fighters. We know from the recollections of Nachtigal Battalion members themselves that in Vinitsa, right outside of Vinitsa, by the village, I believe, of where I live, outside of Vinitsa, they carried what, out. What, 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 what was the name of the village? Brailiv, Brailiv, Brailiv. Brailiv, yeah. Brailiv, thank you. Oh, long time. Yeah, okay, Brailiv. Uh, the unit was stationed there in, in the first week of July 1941. Uh, waiting for destructions where they can march further to the east. And there they took they, their own veteran, one of the veterans, Viktor Kharkiv Kamara, he wrote that we, we saw the atrocities of the, of the Jews, of the Jude, the Jude Komuna, what they did to us. And it so enraged us that we shot all the Jews we found in this village, right? That they write in 1948 in their own recollections, right? And when you present this and you cite this in academic journals and academic articles, right? There is this reaction that, well, First, they, they don't want to believe it. And once you have all the documentation to back it up, then it's a silence regarding this. You have that reaction. That is true. But you also have, which I think is encouraging, you have a number of younger Ukrainian scholars interested in these, these topics. And they bring them up. And there is a new crop of Ukrainian scholars, which I think is encouraging. But you're also right that if Roman Shukhevich figures on Ukrainian official stamps right and have streets named after himself the units that he led would become more become more difficult to deconstruct and understand and problematize these units, Fair, right? but situation is even more uh complicated than what you just mentioned i mean uh and i do not believe that shukhevich or uh, bandera monuments are going to be torn down i don't believe i was born in venus as i said and the, at the crossing of the street, Karmeluka and Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Uh, the area where I was born, called Zamostia, which was a Jewish neighborhood, right next to candy factory, which is now Russian, famous Russian candy factory. It's like within 100 meters away from Russian. I used to climb over the wall there and steal the leftovers of chocolate that they drop down and those uh, horrible things. But in any case, uh, now it belongs to the president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, you know, and he cleaned it up a little bit and nice and everything else. But the thing is why I mentioned where I was born, because in 1954, before 1954, the, ulitz, uh, the, the street Bogdan Khmelnytsky was called Zavatskaya. That is Factory mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. And then they could not find any other street in Vinica other than street in Jewish neighborhood mm -hmm. to name for a great friend of Jewish people, Bogdan Khmelnytsky. That is Hitler of 17th century. Mm -hmm. do, you not, do you understand what I'm talking about? I think it's 
a lack of sensitivity, a lack of understanding, and frankly, an indifference. And uh, they see Khmelnytsky in this nationalist and Soviet tradition as the sort of hero of Ukraine and the pictures and the images that do not fit this, uh, this interpretation fall out. There is less of a sort of like in what the Germans call Aufarbeitung, right? To, to work things through, to address it, to, to critically engage the past, right? History becomes often a way of uh, mobilizing passions and in one direction at the price of blind spots. And there's certainly I blind cannot, spots. I, I, I cannot agree with you that this is indifference because this is a purposeful policy of sticking it to Jews so to show who is the boss. I mean, Bogdan Khmelnytsky Street in Vinica, city Khmelnytsky instead of Praskurov, of mm -hmm. the, one of the most famous pogroms in the whole Ukraine, done by troops named for Simon Pitlura, you know, by this 22-year-old, headed by 22-year-old murderer, Semosenka, you know, on Shabbat, you know, yeah. 1,500 people slaughtered. Um, and that city, famous, Praskurov, is renamed now for Khmelnytsky, for a bandit of bandits, for a great uh, a friend. Why? Uh, and what did he do for Ukraine? You know, this is what I want to talk to you about, too. You know, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, they pride themselves that they're patriots of Ukraine starting with Bogdan Khmelnytsky. What was the result of Bogdan Khmelnytsky activities? Well, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the city was renamed by the Soviets. That's, that's a paradox, right? He became also a hero of the, of the Soviets that they had the order of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. But of course, you're well familiar with how this was Stavit, Stalin, particularly in the, in the later years of his life, how he re related to Jews. So I guess, you know, that, that, that interpretation could be made also. Well... Uh, but I'm saying, what, what was, what, wh the, the, the slaughter of Jews, of Unionites, you know, uh, uh, Catholic, Greek or Catholic uh, Ukrainians, you know, in 17th century, what did that accomplish for uh, Ukraine? It brought Ukraine into servitude of Russia. Mm. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about nationalists and talk about national causes, I think one should be careful also not to project this too far, far back in time. I, I, don't, I don't at all dispute Khmelnytsky's pogroms, and I don't uh, uh, dispute uh, Gonta and the, 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 the violence back then. But whether you can sort of like, you know, interpret this is a, within the roster of, of, of nationalists today, I, I think there would be a little one should be a little bit cautious to talk about Ukrainian nationalism as such before the 1850s, 1860s even. But, but yes, there, was, there were loyalties and there were alliances. And, uh, but I, was, I, I suggest to say that uh, Khmelnytsky was not opposed to Moscow or Russia, right? This was sort of like, you know, a sort of an arrangement that could be, you know, reached and broken rather sort of like, you know, uh, pragmatically by the re rulers of the 17th century. Sweden and Russia has gone from, you know, uh, friend relations to very hostile relations. And it could be, these sort of arrangements were, 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 were frequent. But uh, uh, yes, I, I, I do agree that there are a number of issues regarding the, the Bogdan Khmelnytsky period, which needs to be addressed openly and, and critically. And uh, uh, the topic of anti-Jewish violence has not been a, a very popular one. Uh, and the in, politics of Petrura, what did it give, what did it get to Ukraine? What did it get? More than 100,000 Jews, at, at the minimum 100,000, slaughtered by the forces of Petrura and the Ukrainian war, warlords of that period. Mm -hmm. What did it get for Ukraine? Uh, oh, it, 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 uh, the Ukrainian national project in 1918 to 1920 failed, right? You know, uh, uh, That's not number only because one. Num number two, it, it, it helped. It helped for communists to win power in Moscow and Petrograd. Mm -hmm. You had this sort of like situation generally of, of, of warlordism and the national mobilization, nationalist passions being rather, you know, moderate or, or limited in uh, particularly in East of East of Kiev, right? You know, you you 
it, it ultimately failed because the, the nationalist sentiments were not strong enough. And uh, the federalist option that many of them originally went for, but the Universale was, they wanted a federation with a democratic Russia that became out of the question after the Bolsheviks took power. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to look at this in any other way than, than, than concluding that the, Russia, the Ukrainian revolution of 1917 to 1920 led, uh, uh, brought very limited uh, uh, gains for the Ukrainian national movement and led to this radicalization after 1929 in particular, right? You know, the frustration with the... Uh, that Donsov would, would argue that the, the democratic leadership was incompetent and... Uh, and therefore, of course, as you know, we would need instead to use force and violence to bring about the aim of the Ukrainian state. It frustrated them with a democratic enterprise. And of course, Petliura himself tolerated. You know, he didn't address it the way he should have. He let this happen. And uh, as you right, uh, rightly pointed out, his troops carried out most of the, of the anti-Jewish actions in, in Ukraine, uh, and more so even than the white troops. You know, your friend from Ukraine who is in charge of that museum uh, close to Lvov, Lviv, you know, that you had the problem with, uh, and you showed yourself as a true mensch, as a true human being, you know, standing up for truth. When he traveled in uh, Canada, meeting uh, Harper and uh, other who were thinking of him very highly, uh, I'm talking about... Zabili, huh? Ruslan Zabili. Or Vyatorovich or Ruslan Sabile. And Ruslan. I'm talking about Ruslan, Ruslan. Sabile, yeah. I, I took a look at his archive online that mm. uh, he was getting the money for. And I did searches there for two things. Yevrei, that is Jews, and Pogrom. Mm. And it was very, very revealing. I mean, because the guy claims that he wants to get all the information online and things like this. But... Yevrei Pogrom <laughs> produces nothing there. I mean, and talking about Petlura, of all documents that they have there, and they have a lot of documents, on behalf of Petlura, he was able to put online only one horrible nonsense letter of his Jewish minister of finance uh, and use it as if it... In April, in April, you know, we're talking about what? Um, Proskurov pogrom. February, 1990. Feb yeah. February 15th. Right. So now, March, April, and no mention of pogrom in Proskurov. Right. No mention of Simosenka. No mention of nothing. Right. And this is the most that this guy can bring in defense of his Fuhrer. Well, the funny thing about Ruslan Sabil and this uh, uh, archive, uh, the, the, um, what's it called? Center uh, Daslitsch and Bisvolno Horucho, the study, Center for Study of Liberation Movement, it is funded by the organization of Ukrainian nationalists abroad, the Bandera wing of the UN. They are funding it. They're, they're building up this, they built up this quasi academic organization funded by money from Australia and United States and Canada. And what they've done is that they brought in the, these representatives to have them visit Harvard, Universal, Alberta, and Toronto. And it did this over and over and over again. Uh, and it happens so to be that Universal, Alberta is my alma mater. And uh, when you have somebody who is obviously lacking academic credentials, do not speak English, which is a lingua franca of the academic world, has not published in peer-reviewed journals, and is sponsored by a far-right group that uses my university as a platform, I did speak up against that. I'm not opposed to freedom of speech. In fact, when he was arrested and harassed by the SPU, by the Yanukovych authorities, I signed a letter in his support. I'm not opposed to freedom of speech. What I'm insisting on is standards. And when you talk about this, yeah, of course, this archive they have online, they have made a few documents available which are useful, but they are selective. They're deliberately selective. And if this organization is funded by and run by the Bandera group, that would explain partially Here's the irony about Petlura, the Banderitsi and Konovalets, they hated Petlura. He was a, seen as a philo-Semite. He was a socialist. Philo-Semite uh, in the beginning, not yeah. during the war. Once he was killed by Schwarzbart, and once Schwarzbart was, was let off the hook, so to say, he became a hero. They made him posthumously a hero, but the... But the 
although Ukrainska Vizkova Organizacija originally detested Petlyura, so Petlyura wasn't a friend of the Banderevsi. He became an icon, but they always... Because they detested uh, him because he gave away Western Ukraine. He failed in what he did, right? In what he tried to do. And he was a socialist, right? So... But they're Shnitsky. also socialists. They're not uh, 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 capitalists. They're the fascists. All fascists are socialists. Uh, well, some disclaimer. I mean, like Donsov was an orthodox Marxist as a young man. His brother remained the communist his whole life. Bandera, as a young man, was a great admirer of Lenin, right? You know, mm -hmm. there is this, you know, of course, uh, the, the step between radical leftism, radical rightism, if you can use those terms, mm -hmm. right? You know, Mussolini could take that step and so could Donsov, and, uh, and it, it's, it's not unheard of, right? In Russia, Alexander Dugin now loves both. He loves communists and he loves fascists. You know, just anybody who is against what he calls the worst evil in the world, liberals, that's mm. who he is against. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't disagree with you there. But the idea is sort of like the way of presenting history. You, you know, you, I think you highlighted something rather important here that when you have a cash, a country in economic crisis and underfunded uh, funding for uh, for the humanities. You open up in a chaotic society like Ukraine. Uh, for for frankly, charlatan history writing. You set up a journal like you know, Ukrainsky Vizvolny Ruch, the Ukrainian Liberation Movement. You build a museum, the Turma Alonskoho, which was a museum where where the Stalinists tortured and abused people, where the Nazis abused people, but also where hundreds of Jews were murdered by Ukrainian nationalists in 1941. You build a museum and you emphasize one tragedy and literally cover up the other, right? And uh, my naivete here was perhaps that I, I wasn't seeking a dialogue necessarily with Vyatrovich or Sabili. I respect the right to freedom of speech. What, what I'm interested in is like I treat them as objects of inquiry. I think they have understood just the way you look at Shcherbitsky or, or Dugin or Zhirinovsky. You look at them and you try to understand them and treat them as an object of inquiry. You don't sit down to discuss history with, 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 with I don't know who, you know. You treat them as objects of inquiry, as historical actors in their own role. But own yeah, role. Uh, there's one question that, you know, I really uh, would like, you know, you to help me with. Ukrainian nationalism, you know, seems like every Ukrainian nationalist is just a fascist, a little bit this way or this way, but all of them are fascists. But Ukraine is a country. And there has to be nationalists who are not fascists, that uh, uh, who uh, uh, are concerned about the people of Ukraine and define those people in a way so there would be a place for somebody other than strictly ethnic Ukrainians. Do you see anything like this within Ukrainian nationalism? Well, the problem with Ukrainian nationalists is that the far right, you know, they, they did not call themselves fascist, which I think if you're dealing with the UUN or, uh, in the 1930s would probably be defined as a fascist movement. They used the term, the generic term uh, nationalism, and they were Ukrainian nationalists, right? In, integral, in, integral nationalism. Well, yeah, that sort of like to me is like, you know, not necessarily a very productive way of, you know, of, of, of making sense of this. I think, you know, they used the right raised arm salute, they used the black and red blue to Borden banner. They used military uniforms. They were anti-Semitic. They, were they loved Hitler the same way as leadership now in Vinitsa loves Hitler. Well, so, but I think the, back to your question about nationalism, I guess nationalism comes in all sort of colors and orientations, right? It's not necessarily a right wing issue or left wing issue. There are, you know, some nationalists start up as radical leftists and became radical rightists. Like Pilsudski started up as, as a leftist, became a rather right wing figure. Chiang Kai shek and Sun Yat sen went through a similar I I direction. There are, there are a number of, you know, if nationalism, in the sense of I'm in favor of Swedish or Singaporean or Ukrainian statehood, right? That would be the definition of, of a nationalist. You don't have to be in favor of you know, ethnic cleansing and raised arms salutes and whatnot. So there are many different orientations of nationalism, right? Anyone who's in favor of German statehood would be technically a German nationalist. It doesn't make them Nazis. Uh, but I, I agree. That, that, that is my question. Yeah. I mean, outside of these fascists, is there is a stream of nationalist thinking and feeling and organizing that can be used by Ukraine. Because I have to say, 
if the, if the nationalists today are going to come to power again, it's going to be a short-lived situation. But in a way, I mean, in that sense, Kravchuk and Kuchma and Yanukovych were also Ukrainian nationalists in the sense that they were in favor of Ukrainian statehood, right? So it depends on what you put into this term. If you're looking at the radical sort of what, what John Armstrong prefers to call integral nationalists, right? Essentially, sort of like the authoritarian, uh, non-democratic, uh, often anti-Semitic strand of Ukrainian nationalism. Well, it is, as, 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 uh, as Andrew Wilson suggested in the 1990s, a minority faith. It is strong regionally, uh, and I don't think yet it, it commands, commands support of more than perhaps a quarter of the population. But it, there are a number of, 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 of attitudes that are in flux, and uh, particularly in society in, in, in crisis, uh, not only in Ukraine, but in many places, not only in Eastern and Central Europe, but also Western Europe. There are proclivities towards, you know, various populism. Also in, in the country where you live right now, there is also groups which will qualify uh, in, in that camp. Uh, is the democratic Ukrainian nationalist? I think so. I think it could be cultivated. And I think any form of democratic Ukrainian sort of uh, uh, society would have to be organized within some sort of like, you know, if you excuse the term nationalist framework, right? Within on the basis of an independent Ukraine. It depends on what you fill this state with. And I think there is... Uh, there are also, you know, uh, exep uh, examples of the opposite uh, of, of, of Ukrainians that uh, that support and appreciate um, the Jewish legacy and the multi-ethnic legacy of Ukraine. I think it's uh, Ukraine is as diverse as many other. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. That that is not the question. I mean, there are a lot of Ukrainians that, as you said, appreciate and are curious and not hostile toward Jews whatsoever. In fact. Probably majority of Ukrainians today belong in that category, but uh, the reason I'm so interested in this issue of Ukrainian nationalism is not because I intend to move to Ukraine and then I need to know if it's if it makes sense, but because I want the byproduct of my life activities to give something good for those people. And not only for those people, because Ukraine is not just some off, you know, uh, uh, at the end of the earth society. It's the largest in territory outside of Russia country in Europe. And it has a great future in my mind. So, I but the, huh? I agree. I agree. So, I think, I think there's a lot of potential, yeah. And also, it's, uh, uh, it's a very importantly positioned country. And it will have a lot of impact on people living in and uh, around it. So I want it to be good. You know, uh, when um, Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons, the only country in the world to give up voluntarily nuclear weapons. I mean, I thought it was an astonishing thing. Not, not because they want it, but because, you know, at that time, you know, uh, Russia and the United States came together and the United States guaranteed things. And, uh, well, let's see, you know, where American guarantees take anybody. But uh, uh, the Ukraine, to me, in my mind, could have made out of that lemon an amazing lemonade that could be, you know, a beginning of something completely new, some completely different and great. But they look at this as just some stupid act on the part of Ukrainian leadership. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that is the tragedy that in 1990, the Ukrainian SSR had a GDP per capita, which was higher than that of Poland. Even though Poland was at the bottom of, of the economic transition, and, you know, that was the very poorest part. And now... Uh, Poland has four times, if I'm not mistaken, the GDP per, per you know that Ukraine has, right? That you have 25, almost 30 years of one incompetent and corrupt government after another, and all of them making new promises, and it has been developing in a very unsatisfactory way, I would imagine, for many Ukrainian citizens. But of course, when it raises the issue about nuclear weapons, I think there's also, uh, I think, frankly, you should look at the role of Russia also. Here, Russia accepted, the Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons, handed them over to Moscow, 
in return for security guarantees that Ukrainian independence and state borders would be respected. And they signed in Budapest the memorandum. Russia committed themselves to respect the boundaries of Ukraine in return for nuclear weapons. And but what the United do? States also uh, uh, agreed to guarantee those boundaries. That's right. That's right. You know, that's right. I'm not just pointing fingers at, at, at Russia, Ukraine here. There's, there's a sort of like, you know, a collective effort which has been underwhelming. You know, if you give these guarantees, you have to back them up. So, but, but I think there's, yeah, you, you're putting a finger on a number of, 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 of dilemmas and a number of problems here. And, uh, you know, the luxury of being a historian is you can sit not necessarily in your armchair and point fingers. That's not what we're doing. But we are looking back in time and trying to make sense of this. Uh, for future prospects of Ukraine, I wish Ukraine the very best, as I wish Russia the very best. I like Russia. I like Ukraine. I like Belarus. I would never have bothered to learn Slavic languages. I've never found a fascination. And for that matter, with Jewish history and Jewish culture, which is not mine, but something I think very highly of and respect. I love all those cultures. That's what brought me into this field to begin with. And I like Russia. That's a tragedy. I spent two years in Moscow myself as a, as a, as a grad student. I like Russians. I like Ukrainians. I sort of like, but I feel compelled to choose. It's very easy for the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada, for instance, to talk about a Moscali or a Jedi sometimes and the Liachi and what bad people they are. And of course, the same thing goes for Russian nationalists in, in, uh, that have similar attitudes. I like them all in that sense, right? But I think I was driven by interest in the topic, not by political engagement, but you're forced to sort of like confront very difficult, stark uh, dilemmas when you see friends on social media that unfriend each other or unfriend me sometimes because I'm a pro-Moscovite, uh, a Putin versteher, a Putin lover, or I'm too much Ukrainian nationalist. It's very, very hard to sort of like be disengaged, which I would like myself to be, but I, I guess I'm seen as politically engaged, which is not how I perceive myself. I really have no horse in this race other than wanting, you know, I like to see my Ukrainian colleagues having the same rights and that I like to see the same sort of like standards applied to my Ukrainian uh, uh, colleagues as they expect from me, in that sense, an egalitarianism. There, uh, uh, I do not want to, you know, uh, to push you further into some corner or in between two walls or whatever it is. But what do you think about these uh, elections that are coming uh, March 31st uh, in Ukraine? I mean, uh, the front runner, it seems like a Jewish guy. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not an expert of contemporary Ukrainian politics. To the extent that we're working on this, I've, it's come out of my interest in the Ukrainian uh, integral quote unquote nationalist tradition. I was interested in Svoboda, I was interested in, 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 in private sector and that tradition for historical reasons. I don't feel very competent to, to analyze all the opinion polls and the, the attitudes there, but I guess isn't, doesn't that say a lot about society if a comedian, a popular TV host uh, leads the polls just a few weeks before the election? And if you have Timoshenko, you know, an oligarch fighting what another it, oligarch. What does it say to you? Well, it, 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 I think it's indicative of, of a society with very deep uh, problems with the political leadership, right? If, 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 uh, if, if um, TV personalities, be them Berlusconi or Trump or, 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 or any, any figure anywhere else, takes a leading role, I mean, that, that, that's a crisis of confidence in a political elite. And if you have lived through what many Ukrainian voters have lived through in the past four years, you know, I mean, uh, I think... About, it would be hard for Timoshenko and Parashenko to present themselves as being of the people and experience what the people has been going through. If, if the currency is depleted by 80% and you, and, and, and you as, as president of Ukraine, you enrich yourself, you're having record years, you do not address profound problems of uh, lack of transparency, of corruption. If Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, in the uh, last year in Transparency International's ranking, uh, was essentially an equal place with Nigeria in terms of corruption. You have an issue, a serious issue, which the government has not addressed. So if people vote for a comedian, Jewish or whatnot, you have a problem of confidence of an elite which has not lived up to their, you know, the social contract, which I think Ukrainians, just like Americans for that matter, or Swedes, have the right to expect, I think. Uh, you know, uh my feeling is that I do not expect anything good from this election. I mean, I don't think uh, a situation in Ukraine can be solved by uh, 
Zelensky, by this guy Zelensky. Uh, but the issue of nationalism that we're dealing with is going to come right after elections. If Zelensky is going to win, the nationalists are going to make sure that all Ukrainians recognize instantly that the guy is a Jew. And whatever problems are going to be result of his administration or not his administration are going to be treated that way. My feeling is that this election is the last election of uh, uh, Ukrainian Weimar Republic. How Jewish is Zelensky and how, how does his Jewishness manifest itself? I mean, I see often Ukrainian media presenting me, they emphasize he's Jewish, but is he practicing? Is he a member of the community or uh, very it's often? His mother and father is Jewish, yeah. married to a non-Jewish girl. His mm. children are baptized, they're Christians, you know, they were baptized by his uh, parents-in-law. Uh, he himself, of course, is not a religious Jew. And he does not talk about being Jewish at all. In fact, in his show, he presents himself as a sort of a mimics, not presents, but mimics as Christian. Mm. That was my understanding too. Uh, I, I haven't followed his campaign and, you know, I've seen some of his TV shows on, on YouTube, but I can't say that I have any expertise. I, frankly, a couple of years ago, I hadn't heard about the guy, so I can't really be speaking any authority on, on, on what, would happen if he was elected. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, what the outcome of this is, but of course, uh, most of Ukrainian elections have been, you know, surrounded by hype, you know, the Orange Revolution, the, uh, the, uh, the you know, the election in 2014, and uh, that you have seen disappointments as, as a rule. And not only in Ukraine, there was a number of states, not only in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe also, where, and North America, where there have been elections which have been, you know, associated with troublesome trends, if you put it that way, right? Um, and the final question uh, is this. Uh, do you think that a stable democracy, a stable society, law-abiding society, stable democratic law-abiding society is possible in Ukraine? I do think so. I think if you look at the years of it, which has gone by since you left the Soviet Union in 1974, then again in 1991, if I understood you correctly. I mean, in terms of like civil liberties and, uh, and, and, and personal freedoms and autonomy, I think it's greater now than it was when you first left. If you look at it in a macro trend, right? Even if you look at Putin's Russia and Lukashenko's Belarus, if you look at the period from 1974 until today, there has been a movement in that direction. But I think one has to well, look the at... The difference, uh, I agree with you, the difference is astonishing. Uh, we're not comparing, you know, yeah. apples and oranges. We're comparing, you know, just like incomparable things. You know, what do you see now in Russia, in Putin's Russia, and Ukraine, especially Ukraine? Ukraine is free. Ukraine, yeah, that's is, right. you know, uh, 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 amazing by comparison yeah. to what it was before. But the problems are there. And uh, uh, the problem... Uh, the way I see it, the problem, the big, the big, the biggest problem, is the demographic demography of Ukraine. That is Russian speaking, you know, two Orthodox uh, Christian religions, two Catholic rel types of religions, you know, uh, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking, you know, and all of it is there. No, I, th I, th I think in, in, on, on the sort of medium-long perspective, medium-range perspective, I'm, I'm positive. I think Ukraine has a lot of potential, have ed educated, fantastic, you know, fantastic talented people, a dysfunctional educational system, a university system, unfortunately, but a lot of talent, a lot of resources, and a lot to build on, and strategically, as you pointed out, located. Listen, I think... You know, the role of, you know, historians and people in the humanities period tend to overestimate their own importance. Uh, and uh, I, I'm rather skeptical about our impact. And I think the impact I or any other historian would have on Ukrainian or any other society is limited. But I think what we can do is sort of like raise certain issues. You know, the reason why you have higher levels of anti-Semitism and the, the, the reason why ISIS is active in Syria and Iraq. Uh, it's not just coincidental. They don't act, they're not active in Saskatchewan and Norway. If they have a society which is, which is open, 
openly addressing the issues of the past, doing what the Germans call Aufarbeitung, addressing the difficult episodes of the past, including those of Petlura's troops, including those of the Ukrainian insurgent army, of the NKVD, of Stalin, of the Nazis. If you have a debate about this discussion in which you honestly and in a level playing field address these issues, I think that in that way we can do a modest contribution to improving our understanding and build society by being aware of what happened in Proskurato in 1919 or what, what, what happened in Volin in 1943 or in Lviv in the summer 1941, we might be better equipped. Or for that matter, Vinitsa in 1937-38, when there were massacres by NKVD, by having those discussions, by addressing these issues and not organize an institution like the Center of the of Visvon Horuko, producing documents selectively and glorifying essentially what was perpetrators of crimes, what we call today, crimes against humanity. By discussing, this, discussing these issues, I think we can do a modest contribution to building democracy in Ukraine by, and other societies too, for that matter, Singapore or, or Sweden or wherever you, uh, you and I happen to be, be active. Uh, that's my modest sort of like, you know, point of departure. Uh, I'm not there to point fingers, but I'm trying to sort of like provide tools to understand and make sense of this. And I think this is what sort of has been my sort of like my force in this, right? Trying to understand and the more I see this sort of uh, historical revisionism taking place, uh, the more I think, uh, I feel this is a reason why these issues and these discussions need to be. Uh, there, I, I want to ask your permission. Uh, can we place uh, this, uh, our conversation is going to be also uh, circulated among our members, but also on YouTube. Can we place under this uh, uh, YouTube um, links to your um, papers on academy.edu. Uh, I'd be flattered. I'm very interested. If, we, if, if you find a general readership that are interested in this, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for it. You know, I, I was I'm, interested. Maybe there's going to be some few more people interested in this because this is an important thing, not only for me, not only for you as an author, but also I think for everybody, uh, for Americans, uh, to understand Ukraine would mean for Americans to understand better the United States. I think you're onto something there. Anyway, nice talking to you. Hopefully, it's not going to be our last time. And I wish you the very best. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. As they Thank say you. in China, Zeigizend. <laughs> Zeigizend. <laughs> Thank you.